Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer Software Tool, also known as Mr. Valuation. It's my pleasure to welcome you once again to another Subscriber Request Tuesday series that I've been doing for some time now. One of the areas, or, or, or there's a certain section of companies that subscribers, many subscribers have asked me to cover, so I'm going to try to kill a lot of birds with, so to speak, one stone here today. Um, and actually in the series, this is going to end up being a three-part series of videos. Today, I'm going to be looking at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is, you know, as most of you know, has all long been considered a proxy for the stock market that contains 30 stocks. Now, the Dow's a very interesting index, as I'll get into a little bit more detail as I go through the video. You know, there are only 30 stocks, so it's a nice, concise index, in contrast to something like the S&P 500, where you have over 500 stocks. So the Dow is a nice, neat, little, tidy package that you can look at, and it can be very useful, and I'm going to kind of illustrate that throughout this series here, that you, know, you can really look at relative valuation of the overall market as well as sectors by dissecting the Dow, and I'm going to be doing that. In this first part, I'm going to be looking at 10 stocks that I'm going to call fairly valued or reasonably valued Dows. Out of the 30 Dow, I'm going to repeat that, there are only 10 that I consider reasonably valued. But I'm also going to take the opportunity with this series of videos to illustrate several other things. For one thing, it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. You've heard me say that so many times if you followed my work. So I want you to see just how diverse all the 30 stocks and the Dow Jones actually are. They're all quite unique and quite different in their own right, which is why I always say, you know, as investors, you know, I've got a lot of people, in fact, very recently, I've had a lot of people coming to me saying, you know, I'm really concerned the market's so high. And, you know, I've been talking about how high the market's been for quite time. Now, a lot of other pundits to the likes of Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch and many others are talking about how overvalued the market is right now. And again, we're using the Dow Jones as a proxy for the market. But the reality of it is, you know, people are saying to me things like, well, if the market's so high, there's nothing to invest in. Well, in every market, whether it's a bull market or a bear market, there are always investable stocks to be found. Obviously, you could find a lot more in a bear market than you can in a bull market and vice versa, I might add. But the reality of it is, is it is a market of stocks, not a stock market. And stocks are very, very different. So this idea of thinking in generalities, I think, is actually kind of a false narrative. You want to think about the individual stocks you own. Like I say, again, mind your own businesses. Pay attention to what you own. Look for value and recognize what the valuation of the individual stocks you own are and worry less about what the market. Now, in the short run, a, a crash may take all stocks down, but the undervalued stocks will recover quicker and move more back into alignment with fair value because they were already attractively valued and therefore lowered your risk. And I'll kind of get into that in a little more detail as I go through the video. Overvalued stocks might never come back, at least in your lifetime, depending on how overvalued they are. So let's go ahead and look at today. Let's, let's start by looking at the Dow Jones itself in a kind of a broad base, if you will. We have this preloaded portfolio in fast graphs called the Dow Jones, and these are 30 stocks. And I've created this portfolio with some key statistics here. You know, I use my custom portion and I've picked some areas that I want to be covering in this video. The first thing I want to talk about is the quality of the Dow Jones 30 stocks. Okay, so I'm going to organize this by credit rating. Dow, which is a spinoff from Dow DuPont, which was the original Dow stock, has a very short history. Right now, as of now, does not have a credit rating. I'm sure they'll get one. But otherwise, all of the 30 Dow stocks are investment grade companies. They're triple B rated or higher. Triple B minus for Boeing, which, you know, we all know some of the trials and tribulations of Boeing. We've got the B plus stocks, you know, going all the way through Disney here. We've got several A minus rated stocks, you know, JP Morgan, Amgen, et cetera. We've got A rated stocks in Travelers, Caterpillar, Home Depot through Honeywell International. Then we have A plus rated stocks like Intel, Merck, 3M, United Healthcare Group, Coca Cola, Salesforce.com. And then we got double A minus in Cisco, double A minus in Procter and Gamble and Chevron. Visa and Nike are also double A minus. And then we have double A Walmart. 
AA plus Apple, and then the two AAA rated stocks on the planet, Johnson and Johnson and Microsoft. Of the 11 broad sectors that make up the overall market, nine are covered in the Dow Jones. We have two communication services companies. We have three consumer discretionary. We have four consumer staples. We have only one energy company now. And you can almost, by looking at the makeup here, see what the market is, you know, focused on. In financials, we have four. In healthcare, we have uh, four, and then we have several industrials, and then the broadest, largest sector we have are, is information technology that comes in here with seven, and then we have one material stock, which is the Dow stock. Okay, so we're covering nine of the 11 sectors. We don't have a utility stock in the Dow today, and we, nor do we have a REIT, a real estate investment trust, and otherwise we're covering the broad sector of the market. Next, I want to look at valuation lowest to highest. The 10 stocks I'm going to cover today are going to start with Goldman Sachs. I'm ignoring Boeing because Boeing's got some problems. I'll be covering that in part two of the series. But regardless, I'm looking at the ones that have earnings yields above 6.7%, if you will, or below a P.E. ratio of 15. So that would be Goldman Sachs, Walgreens, Intel, Verizon, Dow, J.P. Morgan, Travelers, Merck, IBM, and Amgen. Okay. And those are the only 10 stocks or nine stocks really in the, uh, or 10, I guess it is, in the, in the Dow Jones that I consider viable from a valuation point of view. They all have different estimated growth rates as well, which is something because it's a function of value and growth, future growth, that gives you the long-term rate of return that you expect, okay, from stocks. Now, the average yield on the Dow Jones is about 2.3 to 5%, somewhere in that category. It's you know, a little bit higher than the market, but the, the dividend yields range from nothing, companies like Boeing and Salesforce, and currently for at least temporarily Disney have no dividend yield. And then you have the highest yielding stocks like Chevron, IBM, Dow, Verizon, et cetera, that are yielding 4% or more. But you're looking at an average yield here. Now, the Dow's makeup has changed a little bit over the years. For example, in 2015, in March of 2015, Apple replaced AT&T, which was a you know, stalwart of the Dow for, for decades. In 2017, as I mentioned earlier, Dow DuPont replaced DuPont. It was formed by the merger of Dow Chemical with DuPont. And then in 2018, Walgreens Boots Alliance replaced General Electric, which ran into some hard times, which was a component of the Dow actually since 1907. In April of 2019, Dow replaced Dow DuPont, which was a spinoff of Dow DuPont, which again was a merger of Dow Chemical Company and DuPont. And then on August 31st, very recently, 2020, Exxon, Mobil, Pfizer, and Raytheon were replaced by Salesforce, Amgen, and Honeywell. So, you know, since, you know, the last several years, there have been some significant changes in the Dow. But with that said, the Dow has, you know, been the stalwart market Dow indice, if you will. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is often referred to as the market, as well as the S&P 500. Okay, so I'm going to go through these, these very quickly with you and look at them. I've created this list of Dow value stocks that I'm calling it. And these are the 10 stocks that I mentioned a minute ago. And I'm going to go through them one at a time with you and allow you to look at, you know, the different valuations and how, you know, really diverse these 10 companies are. But I also, but to, before I do that, I'm going to go to the new version of Fastgrass real quick. I'm going to go through these same 10 stocks very, very quickly. I, what I'm doing here with this next section is just to, I want you to see how different the earnings line, you know, the operating earnings. Here you've got Goldman Sachs that has very, very cyclical earnings. If I go to Walgreens Boots Alliance, you're going to see a company that has a pretty good long-term record of growth, a little interruption you know, during COVID, the COVID recession. And then, of course, earnings growth is expected to grow, to increase again. You see periods of very high valuation, but this is a materially different looking stock than what we looked at just a second ago. When I go into Intel, you're going to see that Intel has, a, again, a much different record. It's kind of similar in cyclicality. It has, you know, fits and starts of earnings. But in the long run, I also want you to notice with all these examples, the stock price eventually aligns itself with the intrinsic value, which is the orange line on the graph. So these are very, very different types of companies we're looking at. Verizon is a, 
almost the closest thing we have to a utility, if you will. It's got very, very low earnings growth for many, many years. More recently, growth has accelerated a little. If I shorten this time frame, you can see that growth um, over the last, well, you know, we'll go back since maybe 2014 has averaged about 6%. The long-term growth rate, though, has been 3% for these low years. So again, you get to see that. Then here's Dow, which was just recently spun off, so we have very little history. But it started out with some pretty weak, you know, two weak years in a row. They've had a nice strong recovery in 2021. Of course, this was COVID, which was obviously a horrible time for them to be spun off. But analysts are still expecting relatively spotty, even negative growth going forward. JP Morgan has been a reasonably consistent, what I would call quasi-cyclical company with kind of a spotty dividend record as well. And then Travelers has been a very cyclical stock. But again, you see that the price kind of goes where earnings goes. It has a pretty decent record. Merck, like a lot of the big pharma, including Pfizer, kind of ran into a period of low growth. Their growth rate is starting to accelerate again for a lot of reasons, which I won't be able to get into in this discussion. IBM had a great growth record for many, many years. In the last five or six years, they've really been struggling you know, to grow their business. But the bottom line is things are beginning to look up. One thing that we'll have with this new version is a, a sales. You can see that their revenues have been very flat here in recent years when you're looking at IBM. But nevertheless, if you look at operating earnings, they just had a really good quarter. They exceeded estimates and analysts are expecting the turnaround to start to manifest going forward. Amgen has really been a stalwart growth stock for a long time. And then they started paying their first dividend in 2011. And, you know, since that time, their dividend has increased, their payout ratios have increased, and it's been a kind of a very attractive stock. And here you see the effects of overvaluation. Again, high valuation led to very poor performance for many years. But then once it got reasonably valued, it's been a stalwart performer for the last several years. So let's go through these now, going back to the current version of fast graphs here that we're using. And let's look at these stocks with a little more detail. From a performance point of view, we have Goldman Sachs with a very cyclical record with a 10.9% annualized earnings growth rate. But again, it's been spotty. Performance-wise, the stock has performed about in line with the S&P 500. It has underperformed it in dividend income and slightly underperformed it in total rate of return due to the cyclical nature of the stock. Now, if I shorten the time frame and I get a little better valuation from it, now we start to get some, you know a rate of return that again are slightly under the the market. But the point is that this stock today looks inexpensive. So if you buy any of these stocks when they're when they're expensive relative to when they're inexpensive, you can certainly do better. So we're looking at a normal PE of 11. This is market value. There would be potential to make 14 or 15 percent over the next couple of years in Goldman. If it earns this money that the analysts are expecting and goes reverts back to a 15 PE, you could have a 25 percent annualized rate of return. Um, you know, the reality is you can't buy the past. You can only buy the future. So looking to the future, the valuation is attractive. Earnings yield is over 10 percent. The PE is nine you know, so we're looking at P.E. expansion plus some modest growth, but again, cyclicality. So you have to take all these things into consideration when you're looking at investing in a stock. Walgreens Boots Alliance is very, very inexpensive today. It's been inexpensive for the last several years. But, you know, there's a story here that needs to be told because people talk about it all the time. And when I get into parts two and three of this series... Uh, this will even be more dramatic, but markets can misappraise stocks and they can do it for long periods of time. Walgreens, for example, got very highly valued back in you know, 1999, 2000, 2001. And here we are into February of 2002, which at, at the, you know, the peak valuation is a PE of 43. And you can see that even though the orange line grew kind of nicely during this period of time, you know, the performance was actually a negative 1% rate of return, and that included dividends, but yet the business did good. Now, once valuations got in alignment, even if you look at today's low valuation, you still made 7 or 8%. Valuation is also a great risk mitigator. But look at the dividend record of the stock. This is the part that I always want to emphasize when I'm looking at these blue chip dividend paying stocks. If you buy them when they're reasonably priced, even when you run into hard times, you can make some money 
But the key point is your dividend income is going to be very, very attractive. You know, this company has grown, Walgreens has grown their dividend by just under 15% a year on average, compound average growth of 14.5. It's had some really great years and some poor years, but the point is the dividend has been very, very consistent despite all the volatility we see in the stock price. Moving on, looking at Intel, it's a obviously a semiconductor company, moderately cyclical, but yet has growth, a growth component. Average growth has been about 10%. It was, you know, back in 01 and 02, it was very, very expensive. PE was over 67. Again, this led to, you know, uh, what they call the lost decade again, a very a long extended period of time, a very poor performance. But then once the Great Recession kind of reset everything, it's been a really good performer, averaging over 14% a year since February of 09. And, and that includes some pretty good dividend and consistent dividend growth. The long term record here shows that it dramatically underperformed the market. However, that was mainly a function of it being massively overvalued. If I shorten this time frame and get to the point where valuation was in alignment, you know, coming out of the, the Great Recession here, it significantly outperformed the market, the S&P 500 in terms of income, did pretty well as a capital appreciation, averaged 11%. But remember, this was a time when the market itself did extraordinarily well. But it came out as a great investment. But the key thing here is it's been more of a high-yield income investment or higher dividend growth investment than it's been a total return investment. Verizon, as I talked about earlier, went through a long extended period of very weak growth. You can see earnings growth, you know, going up through just coming out of the Great Recession here. Earnings growth during this time was actually a negative 3%, if you will. So, you know, this wasn't a time where the stock grew very fast. And again, I'm using the tool here to be able to determine that. But now, if I run this back through the last, you know, 14 or 15 years, we're starting to get market average, respectable 6% growth. We have a 4.5% dividend yield on Verizon. We have a PE of under uh, 11, an earnings yield of 9%, and a dividend yield of 4.5%. Now, their dividend record growth has been low as the growth of the earnings have been low, but they have slightly increased their dividend every year, and they have dramatically paid more dividend income than the market. So if, you know, in lieu of a bond, for example, if you're looking for a good income vehicle, Verizon's probably, you know, a stock that you might want to consider. From a standpoint of going forward, we're looking at very weak growth continuing, maybe 3% on average. But again, if the stock normally trades at around a 12 or 13 multiple, that would still give you the opportunity to make double-digit returns going forward. If you're looking at it going to a P, you could make almost 14% over the next two or three years. So Verizon would be a good choice as a blue chip, you know, with a good, strong dividend yield going forward. Dow, you know, I mentioned this before, you know, the stock came out of probably the stock was spun off probably at the worst time. It could have been, of course, no one knew that at the time. But nevertheless, its performance has been kind of interesting. It's produced more dividend income than the market, but dramatically underperformed the market over this time frame. You know, the overall, if you're using the S&P 500 as the market. But the stock is reasonably priced today. The P.E. is 11. Earnings yield is 8.8. .8. Dividend yield is 4.5. We don't have a real long dividend record, but I do expect cyclicality out of this stock going forward. And that's something you'd want to consider before you invested in it. J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the better, higher quality financials in the world, A minus rated, moderate debt. The stock is semi-cyclical. It suffered during the financial reset that we saw in the 08-09 Great Recession. However, it actually fared better than most. It did reduce their dividend during that time frame, but since then, it's been you know it's been increasing their dividend at a very nice rate since they started, you know, getting back on track with their dividend. Their dividend has grown at over 30% a year. So once they kind of got healthy again, the company, you know, recommitted to their shareholders, you can see that their payout ratio, you know, increased dramatically here. They were paying out only 5% of their earnings in 2010. They increased it to over 20% in 2011. The long-term performance here has also been very exceptional. They've paid more income than the market, and they've came pretty close to mirroring the market. And, you know, in the end, they slightly edged it out. But we'll, let's say it was a dead heat of the market with a lot more income than the market you could have got from buying an index fund. And that's a reason to consider something. Even here, 
though you slightly beat the market, you really tied the market, but you got a lot more income. That's the difference between buying an individual stock and investing in something like the market. Moving on, Travelers has been another A-rated financial with very moderate debt. Its dividend record is not quite as good as some of the others out there, but its long-term performance, you know, it did produce more dividend income, but they did have a period in 04 and 05 where they did reduce their dividend. But otherwise, the average growth has been about 6%. So the record is, of their dividend is good, not great. But you can see the price tracks earnings. It's very reasonably priced at a blended PE of 12.9. Gives it an earnings yield of 7.7 .7 and a dividend yield of 2.3%. This stock's got good potential going forward. You could make very strong double-digit rates of return if it trades at a normal PE of 15. The five-year average PE has been about 13. That would still give you, you know, just under 10% annualized rate of return. So Travelers is a very high-quality company in the Dow that's reasonably priced. Merck is, you know, obviously a, a large pharmaceutical, earnings yield over 7%, dividend yield over 3%, PE 13.37. The stock has started to reaccelerate. You can see that their growth rate you know, has kind of accelerated it, flattened out, you know, for many, many years like most pharmaceuticals did. Forecast-wise, it's expected to grow at 9% going forward. That would easily give it a 15 fair value P.E. ratio, which means you could make, you know, 15 to 16% a year out for the next two or three years investing in A-plus rated Merck. So Merck, I think, is one of the more attractive Dow stocks today. IBM is a behemoth turnaround, A-minus rated, you know, it's gone through, as I showed you earlier, some very weak earnings results, but the company's in transition. Their last earnings report exceeded estimates. The stock looks like it's starting to recover. Analysts are expecting double-digit growth for the next two or three years. So, you know, this could be a great time to be in, taking a position in, you know, the old long-term stalwart IBM. It's been a tough road for the last several years. I'm an investor here because I really like the dividend. If I look at the dividend record of the company, it's increased their dividend by over, we'll call it 14% on average. It's thrown off significantly more income than the Dow. And it did give positive rate of return long term, although the rate of return in recent years, if I shorten this time frame, the rate of return has actually been the, the, the capital appreciation has actually been very, you know, modest at about 2.6% a year. But you add in dividends and it's averaged over 4%. I like IBM going forward more than I like, obviously, its history. So here's one that you might also want to consider. And then last but not least is Amgen. And Amgen is kind of the quintessential value growth story, if you will. When valuation was very, very high, like back in 2002, it led to an extended period of time, several years, where you know the, the stock didn't make any money, but yet the business did great. In 2011, they started paying their first dividend as the company's growth rate was being forced to slow down. And you can see that by looking at the bottom of the graph here, they started paying a dividend. They started out with a low payout ratio, and then that payout ratio has increased nicely. If you look at their dividend record alone, they've grown their dividend by over 30% a year, but that was due to some anomalous growth you know, when they first started out. But they've still been paying you know, double-digit dividend growth for many, many years here. This company still has a lot of growth potential. It's expected to you know, slow down to about 5% a year going forward. Longer term, it's expected to grow at 9%. So once they get past these next couple of years, we should start seeing you know, better growth. But this number, this 5% number, I want you to make sure you understand the math. It's expected to be negative growth this year, followed by 9, 8, and 6. And that's why you see long-term growth of 9 getting past that. So if I use the custom calculator here and combine the two, this gives us the potential to make, you know, a nice double-digit rate of return with almost a 3% dividend yield and earnings yield over 7% and a P.E. ratio of 14.05. So these are what I would call the 10 stocks of the 30 stocks in the Dow that are reasonably attractive. In parts two and part three, I'll be covering 10 more. I'll be going from the more moderately valued stocks to the really excessively valued finally in part three, the ones that I consider to be dangerously overvalued. So stay tuned to the series. This has been Chuck Carville saying thanks for watching. If you like this video and my other videos, give me a like, uh, a thumbs up, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I look forward to talking to you again with the rest of this series 
tomorrow and the next day. Thanks for watching.